Welcome to Auburn, Our Story, a series presented by the White River Valley Museum exploring unique perspectives on our area's extraordinary history. For much of the 20th century, life in Auburn revolved around the railroad. In 1900, the Palmer Cutoff made Auburn the western end of the Northern Pacific's line across Stampede Pass, the first direct railroad connection to the east. In 1913, the railway opened Auburn Yard, transforming a tiny agricultural community into a bustling center of the Industrial Revolution. Employment at the yard was nearly equal to the entire population of the town in 1913. Railroaders became mayors, merchants, homeowners, school board members, and singers in church choirs. In this episode, former railroad employees discuss daily life on the job, the overall function of the railroad, and the legacy of the Auburn Yard. My name is Roger D. Campbell, and I live in Auburn, and I have since 1939. We moved here from South Dakota. My dad worked for the Milwaukee back there, and of course we came out here, and I was still going to school at that time. Well, when I got into junior high in school, um, the Railway Express Agency, which is gone now, they needed another baggage smasher. That's the person that hauls the luggage around, you know, they call, call them baggage smashers, and take cream cans off of trains and stuff at East Auburn, and they asked me if I'd like to go to work for them. I worked for them three days a week, four hours a day, and that was out of the main depot and at East Auburn. My name is Doris Tuntland. I uh, have lived in Auburn since 1939. I went to high school here and my family were railroaders. My father was a freight agent in Dakota. I was 18 when I went to work for the Milwaukee Railroad. At, at that time, you, uh, there wasn't a lot of men. It was 1944 and there wasn't a lot of young men. They were all in the service, so it was fairly easy for a woman to get a job by 1944. You had to be a qualified typist and uh, I, for the Milwaukee Railroad, I was an expense clerk. That was how we started out. I served as a cashier for some time while the cashier, who was the bookkeeper, uh, was off on maternity leave. I, um, and you did all the jobs, you know. You went out to see if the tra what was on a track. You had to check the cars on a track. You had to uh, check a train that was going by and you were not pampered because you were a woman you had to work and do the, and you drew the same wages as a man so it was no more unfair that you did the same work i liked my job down at the milwaukee because it was all inside and even the little bit i did have to go out and check a train once in a while i um i i liked yeah, I did. And when I came back to work for the Burlington Northern, I hired out with them. I went to Tacoma and I worked calling crews there. As an, um, I worked in the big depot down on uh, Pacific Avenue in the chief dispatcher's office, and I was a steno for the chief dispatcher. I, you know, that was a whole different part of railroading, and I, I really did like that. I. From there, I came back to Auburn Yard and worked for a while, and then when, and I never had my own job. I was an extra clerk. If somebody laid off, I got called, or if someone took a vacation, I would fill in for the vacation. And I worked the diesel shop and the material department and the car shop. Well, my name is Jim Taylor. I'm brakeman conductor for the Northern Pacific, Burlington Northern. And uh, I started railroading here in Auburn in 1950 with the NP. And uh, worked most of my time out of Auburn, a few times in Seattle, but most of it was done right here in Auburn because as far as I was concerned, the Northern Pacific was the only railroad. So it, uh, but I enjoyed every, every minute of it, I really did. When I first started working, we worked 16 hours a day. Yeah, six days a week on a local, yeah. And uh, I worked the North Bend local for quite a while. And that was 16 hours and drove back and forth every day. And uh, that's before the Highway 18 was in and you had to go around Lake Washington. And so it was, it put in long nights. You get about three hours, three and a half, four hours sleep is all you get out of the day. 
but uh, everybody did it and everybody got used to it and it was 16 hours when I came here and, and then gradually it dropped down to 14 and then it went down to 12 and it's been 12 ever since then and so but we can still work 12 hours a day seven days a week if they so desire but and uh, the conductor had well up until the time it he still had a lot of power but before I went to work the conductor could hire and fire anybody he wanted to. I'm David Sproul and I worked at uh, both the Auburn Depot and at the Auburn Yard Office beginning in 1960 uh, through about 1966 or 67 at which time I became a train dispatcher in Tacoma. My name uh, was Ruth Trueblood when I started on the railroad in 1944 but actually um, I graduated from high school in Tacoma in 1943, right after I was, I had my 17th birthday, and uh, I, uh, that first summer, uh, my dad called me into the living room and he said, to "Ruth, move out. I'm not going to pay your bills anymore. Get a job. Move out." It scared me to death. Well, my name is Jim Fredrickson. I'm born and raised and went to school in Tacoma and went to work for the Northern Pacific Railway in Tacoma in 1943 as a crew caller. He used to call the uh, train crews and engine crews and tell them what time to report for duty. And then learned to telegraph. There was a telegraph office uh, right next to where the uh, crew caller's desk was. And when you start out as a telegraph operator, you're on what they call the extra board. and um, You'd just be sent around the division, which was everything west of Yakima on the Northern Pacific, to um, relieve the um, regular telegraphers when they wanted a vacation or a day off or were sick or for reasons like that. And it was about 1944 that I first worked at the telegraph station <clears throat> at the yard office in Auburn. Actually, Auburn had two telegraph stations, one in the yard office, and then there was a telegraph office in the uh, passenger station, which was up at where the uh, tracks cross Main Street. Every seven days, a bulletin would come out in the yard office of how many jobs were open for bid on the Tacoma Division, which extended all the way from Tacoma to Seattle to Yakima and all the area right here. There was different divisions that had different seniority rosters in each division. Just for the craft that I was in, I was in the clerical class, craft. I belonged to the um, B of RC, Brotherhood of Railway and Air, Airline Clerks, was what I, what the union we had. There were four or five different unions hooked up with the railroad and different crafts. And I worked here at Auburn Yard for, um, oh, I think about two or three months and then I had, went to uh, Kelso. I worked in Kelso and then I bid back up to Seattle as a timekeeper for the B&B &B. and then a job came up for bid here in Auburn on the afternoon shift and I bid for that and got it. And uh, I was here ever since. I worked as a inbound train clerk and a waymaster. It's kind of a relief job. Well then I bid off of that and went to reefer inspector and I liked that job. It was a good job. And uh, I got bumped off of that, and I ended up as a outbound train clerk. There was very quite a few clerks in the Auburn Yard. I would say on the day shift alone, um, there was probably 30 clerks. Yard clerks, car clerks, uh, reefers inspectors, waymasters, uh, rip track clerks, everything like that. Now that was just one branch of the railroad. The diesel house had quite a few of employees in it. So did the roundhouse, the rip track, the storeroom, the section had an awful lot of employees. And uh, then there was the car cleaners on the south end, which were part of the section. I might say that the section was, by, I figured, was the most important part of the railroad because of the fact if they didn't put the rail down, the trains would not move. And it was very important there. Other crafts might think, well, mine's an important job. Everybody's job was important. But without the section, we would have never moved. And that's the way it was. You had to um, 
keep track of when a car was put on a track to be loaded and when it was loaded the they would notify you they were given two days you know free to load the train or lo load the car and um, if they it was more than that they were charged so every all of those records had to be kept and that was what your job was to and then the government was here in Auburn then the, we called it the H and R point and though we never went out there and checked the tracks uh, when a train would set out on the in track you'd have to verify the cars and when they brought cars out and put them on the track but you never went inside and did any checking though we had an office down there in the buildings and uh, you, they had a representative from the Burling or from the Northern Pacific and they had one from the Milwaukee and the Union Pacific and and so I was I served in that position uh, for some time worked the afternoon shift uh, a lot of trains come into Auburn a lot of trains went out of Auburn uh, this was the main yard for making up a lot of things every day they would run a A manifest out of here a B manifest and an AB manifest. They were going east out of here. Uh, when they had the steam engines in town here, they could carry out of here with two steam engines going full bore out of here and going over to Leicester, on over to Yakima. Uh, 34, 3,500 tons was the most they could take out of here. And then they put a helper on at Leicester to help push it, get it over the hill through the tunnel. Well, then when the diesels come in, they boost it to 4,250. And that, they still had to have a helper at Leicester because that was quite a climb going around the boring curve up there before they went into the tunnel. Now these new diesels they have now, they'll get up as high as 63 or 64. And they're even building bigger engines, the evolution engine they call it. Of course, when I started on the railroad, the biggest boxcar was 50 foot long. And that was only 50 foot long because it carried automobiles. Most everything was 40 feet long. They didn't have gondola or uh, hoppers to bring grain in. It was all put in boxcars. They put grain door boards in front of the door. They'd blow it in there. And then when they unloaded it, they pulled the doors out of there and all the grain would come out of it. Now they bring it in hoppers. The most you could carry in those 40-foot boxcars was probably 60, 70 tons. Now they carry 120 to 150 ton in these big hoppers. Well, Auburn had been the big... Uh, uh hub for the Northern Pacific, transcontinental trains would come into Auburn and then they would be split up there and, and local trains run with um, cars for branch lines and then they had what they called transfers going to Tacoma and Seattle. And they would take Tacoma and Seattle cars that had come into Auburn and then bring cars from these points into Auburn and then they'd be made up for trains um, going to the east. When we take a train out of Auburn Yard, it's got all the industries in that train for where we work. So we set those cars out and pick up cars at that industry going along the way. And we make up our train in and when we get all that done then we turn around and come home. Bring it back into Auburn and bring it into Auburn Yard and then the switchmen switch it out. The yard was built in 1914 here. The trains would come from all areas, Darrington, uh, North Bend, uh, up at um, Sumner, out of Sumner, they bring in a lot of logs. Logs uh, came in here and they would go to uh, Tacoma to be processed. Some were processed here in Auburn. Uh, it put an awful lot of people to work here. Well, the main thing is uh, when I was first going to work with forest products, there were lumber, shingles, doors, plywood, and uh, that was all going by rail then. Now it's uh, uh, most of the trains are uh, containers with import merchandise from the Orient. Comes across on ships, then is loaded onto, uh, or these containers are loaded onto flat cars, and away they go across the country. There's a very heavy movement of uh, of grain on hopper cars. Comes from the Midwest to the coast ports and it's unloaded there and loaded onto ships. A lot of coal moves by rail, but um, there's not so much of the um, 
small merchandise business anymore. That's been kind of taken over by trucks. They even had a night section crew here that iced cars. They used to put ice in refrigerator cars. And it was a crew that just worked the night shift. But they came off the section gang seniority roster. And I remember Mike Facile, or Facelli as it was properly pronounced, but most of us just called him Facile, uh, was the night foreman for that crew. They shipped in things that were then shipped overseas, so that they were brought in and like, I can't think of anything offhand, but food was sent and it must have been that we, oh, I know we got potatoes from Idaho. I remember billing that and, and then they would ship those overseas. They'd divide them up or wherever they were going to go. And then after the war, um, we got trains of um, uh, dining cars and sleepers and all the things that were, had been used to transport the troops. And there, there was trains of them, like, not, you know, maybe 50 cars like that that were brought in. And I would imagine those were bought by wrecking crews that took the, tore them apart. While the Northern Pacific was operating passenger trains, uh, uh, East Auburn was a transfer point. They had shuttle trains, kind of like a limousine by train that came out of Tacoma. To East Auburn, people would get off the connection train at East Auburn and get on the through train or get off coming west. <laughs> and there was a lot of mail and express. Uh, I've seen the morning train come into East Auburn and have uh, 400 sacks of mail for Tacoma to unload. They'd be there almost an hour just unloading mail. <laughs> but then the post office department uh, left the railroads and went to airplanes and trucks, so that phase disappeared. At one time here in Auburn Yard when it was going full bore, we had 21 tracks in this yard on the, off of the main yard. 21 of them, where we made up trains and trains come in and we switch. Had 20 class tracks down in the south end where they classified cars. And then they had seven house tracks and four Tacoma yard tracks. It was a big yard. The longest train we could take out of here then was about maybe 104 cars and that was beyond the track. From 39 on to the war was over. Um, you know, the whole town kind of operated around the railroad. If there was an emergency and the crews were called to come in like a, a wreck or a derailment or something, they had a, a signal, they, um, and I can't remember, I think it was two or three blasts on the air horn up there at the diesel shop, and they would, uh, that told the men they would go to work, ever to come to work. And then they had a, a noon whistle that blew. I mean, you know, the town just kind of worked, the railroad kind of worked the town. And it, it was nice, too. You know, in the, we lived out beyond Terminal Park area, and Terminal Park was all railroad people. Uh, there wasn't what you call Ma and Pa grocery stores then. They were a fair-sized grocery store at that time. Of course, Massey ended up being the biggest grocery store, I believe, in the state. And... Uh, even when we had wrecks, you know, a train would go off the track someplace between here and Yakima or down south or up north. The, uh, the first thing you do is the dispatcher would call and say, the train is off the track and we got to get it back on. Well, they'll call a wrecking crew and one of the guys in the wrecking crew was a cook and he'd go to call up Massey and they'd open the store at 2 o'clock in the morning. This guy was in there buying groceries to fill up the little sh cook uh, car all the time. Well, when I came to Auburn, <clears throat> 1947, there was 4,000 people here, and it was all railroad town. Everything was railroad, and uh, it stayed that way for years, and then more Boeing and that moved in, and that kind of changed things, and gradually it, the Auburn or the railroad kind of faded away, and you could walk down the street now and, and not see anybody you know for a week, you know. But then you knew everybody. Everybody was a rail. There was a tavern in town called the Rail Tavern. And sometimes when you wanted to call a crew, you'd go up there. Not that they were drinking in there. They played an awful lot of cards in there. 
cards seemed to be a great pastime for the, for the people. The men would be gone like they'd go to Yakima, and the women became such good friends, like they had card clubs, they were all railroad wives, and, and my mother was involved in that, even though she was her husband. At that point, my dad had died, but she still was a railroad wife. <laughs> You learn by doing, yeah. You can't, you can't show anybody on a piece of paper or in a book on a railroad. You can't do it. It's just an impossibility. But uh, you got to have a hands-on work. There's no doubt about that. And uh, you can learn a lot quicker that way, too, you know, if you do it yourself. And, and uh, so, but it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a learning experience, the whole railroad is. It's altogether different than any other job you could ever want. It, uh, there's none I ever wanted, and when I got out of high school, I just I, was, I had all intentions of becoming a civil engineer. Well, then, in the process of not going to school, for, I went to work for the railroad, and I thought, well, I'm not going to leave here, so I stayed there. Northern Pacific Railroad had an ad in the paper, and they were going to train Morse code telegraphers to to fill their stations because there weren't enough people to uh, to keep their stations open. And so this attracted a lot of girls, especially, and there were boys, of course, too, but they, um, they came from farms, they came from everywhere. This, we had gone through the Depression, everybody was poor, they were, we were looking for a way out. So I went down to the depot, the Union Depot in Tacoma, and they said you had to be 18. Well, I was 17. But I told them I was 18, and I gave them my correct uh, uh, birth date. And um, I had to take a railroad uh, physical, and um, they gave me a free pass, and in no time at all, I was on my way to North Dakota, Jamestown, North Dakota. And their, uh, real, their um, Morse code uh, school was on the second floor of the uh, railroad depot. And we went to school uh, six days a week. We got paid 30 cents an hour. We learned uh, Morse code. First, uh, we'd write uh, little marks on paper. We couldn't figure out what the, what the letters were. There was a teacher sending Morse code to all of us. And uh, finally, uh, we'd recognize a letter. And then a word came, and two words came. Pretty soon, we had a sentence. So we learned Morse code that way. And then later, there was another room, and it was, uh, had all kinds of uh, desks in it with the sounders, and uh, we became stations all along the Northern Pacific. We had call letters, and we had a, a teacher who, was, who sent train orders to us. We practiced copying train orders. And then we had a third room, and it was the uh, railroad accounting, and we learned how to do uh, the railroad uh, business. We knew that if we weren't absolutely accurate with those train orders, there could be a train wreck. So we knew that everything had to be accurate, and we really zeroed in on that. I think we did a darn good job. Well, it was, it was like learning a foreign language, and it, it just took a lot of practice, 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 practice. And uh, it wasn't easy, but uh, it seemed like all of a sudden it would start coming to you, and uh, from then on it was much easier. Well, it's made up of dots and dashes, dits and daws. Like uh, the letter A is a, a dot and a dash, like da da. A B is a dash and three dots. You'd work with um, people that were really good senders, and then others that it was kind of like handwriting. Some people had good handwriting, and some people had bad. Well, that was the way with telegraphing. Some were good and clear, and others you had to struggle a little bit to understand it. Well, each telegraph desk basically had uh, a hand key that was uh, provided by the railroad, and you'd um, usually these were in a kind of a little box that was called uh, an amplifier, and then you'd have a usually have a tobacco can to uh, make the sound louder. Just for example, working the four to midnight shift at the Auburn Yard, you'd start off just after four o'clock copying car order messages from Tacoma going to the yardmaster, and that would go on for about two hours. Well, about the same time you started doing that, 
they would start switching the rip track, the repair track, and that engine pulling the cars from the repair track would come right by the office window, and it was so loud that you had to have a little amplification of the uh, telegraph sound to be able to hear it. <laughs> At a station like Auburn Yard, uh, there was a, a lot of telegraphing there for um, copying the messages from the car distributor in Tacoma. And then for every train departing Auburn for Yakima, you'd uh, contact the operator at the, the yard office in Yakima and then send him by Morse Telegraph a list of all the cars in the train that was on its way. It'd have the car number and the contents and the destination. And that could be, you know, 100 cars sometimes. It would take 10 or 12 minutes to send an entire list. Well, I had a, what was called a relay station in Tacoma. Uh, you'd send a lot of telegrams there for the division headquarters, or if you had a, a message for uh, someplace beyond Tacoma, like uh, Centralia or Elma or Hoquiam, you'd uh, send that to Tacoma, and they would relay it on to the these other stations. In Seattle had a major relay station that um, if you had anything for east of Yakima, particularly for St. Paul where the railroad headquarters were, you'd send it to Seattle and they would resend it beyond. Wow. But at Auburn you could talk to uh, Ravensdale and Kanaskut and Leicester and Easton and Cleel and Ellensburg and Yakima. You had a line to them also going up north to uh, Oh, Woodenville, Everett, Arlington, Cedar Woolley, Sumas, Bellingham. Uh, you were there basically to copy these train movement instructions when the dispatcher needed to issue them for a train. Other times you would uh, sell tickets, uh, take Western Union messages uh, from people that came in that wanted to send the telegram or uh, copy Western Union messages for people in the town. And in a small town, uh, you'd either phone them or just walk out and deliver them. But then there were different kinds of reports that uh, were assigned to the operators. Uh, and then in some stations, like at Kanaskut, about 20 miles east of here, you'd uh, check the yard is what they called it. You'd go out and walk along the track the yard tracks, the side tracks, and write down the numbers of all the cars that were on these tracks and uh, write them down on a form called a yard check. And there were just assorted jobs like that. Uh, <clears throat> most uh, small town stations handle Railway Express. People, uh, it was before UPS and FedEx and companies like that, people shipped by Railway Express, but they'd bring their package to the station and you'd uh, look up the rate, make a little bill for it and collect the money and then when the passenger train came, load the Express on the train. And then vice versa, you'd take Express for your town off the train. The telephone rang. The chief dispatcher in Tacoma called. He said, I'm putting you to work, Ruth. Go down to McCarver Street in Tacoma and break in. So I did. And I was only there a few days, and um, I got a work message that said to go to Canasket and work third trick until further notice. So the next day I crawled on the train and rode up to Canasket. Got off the train, and there was no depot. The depot had burned down. The depot was a, a remodeled boxcar. Half of it was the office and half was the waiting room. And I asked the, the um, agent, I said, um, well, where am I going to live? Because usually the operators would live in the depot, the living quarters. And he said, well, we've got a cabin for you up in the woods. He says, Gurley, I hope you have a flashlight. There aren't any street lights around here. You'll be walking at midnight. So he took me up there to show me the cabin. It was one room. And... Um, there was a stove in there and a table and a couple of chairs and no hot water tank, no bathroom. And I found out that uh, my bathtub was a tin uh, tub hanging on a nail in the woodshed. And every bit of hot water that went into that 
that uh, tub had to be heated on top of the wood stove. So I had to stop and heat every pan of water I had. And uh, that's the way I lived. And life, you know, was for a telegrapher, uh, a girl telegrapher was hard because there were no extra things for us. And we ate, at Easton, we ate in this cook car that the railroad furnished. And um, I remember going over there one morning and the cook had a dirty apron uh, wrapped around his middle and he was cooking my breakfast. He had a bowl in his arm like this and he was stirring and he had a cigarette and the ashes about so long they fell in the bowl and he kept on stirring and I thought, I gotta get out of here. I've gotta get an apartment. <laughs> A lot of the telegraph stations were in small towns, and, and there was a railroad office for that town. There were some stations that were just the telegraph only for the uh, movement of trains. One of these was uh, called Black River. It was where they tracked coming down from Canada, uh, the Lake Washington belt line that's in the news now because they're going to tear it up. But uh, that came into the main line at Black River, and they would get their orders there to continue on. And the other way around, when they came from Auburn going north to Canada they, uh, or Everett, uh, they would get their orders at, at Black River. And there was a, a number of small stations just for train movement, like uh, Eagle Gorge was one, at about 25 miles east of here where the... Uh, Howard Hanson Dam is now. There's a telegraph station there. Stampede, Martin, were all stations that were strictly for train movement. Oh, at Eagle Gorge was a depot over the Green River. No electricity. Our only way to keep food was in a, in a box uh, under a waterfall. We'd have to reach in behind the waterfall and get our, get our food. And... Um, we, uh, I, there, were no, there was no bathtub. There was, if you wanted any uh, groceries, you had to send them by the local, railroad local. Conductor would take it down to Canasket and leave the order, and then the next day uh, they'd pick it up on their run and they'd bring the, the groceries back up to us. We lived on canned goods mostly. And um, that's the way life was. It was very, very simple. Probably the most important use of the telegraph was to, for the uh, train dispatcher in Tacoma, uh, which is a train traffic controller, would send movement instructions to a telegraph station. The operator would copy these instructions on a piece of paper and then deliver them to the trains. If the train was going by, uh, uh, he could hand them up with what was known as a hoop. It was a fork stick that had a string in it that had a loop in it that you could put the uh, orders in. And then the um, con conductor and engineer would um, grab their orders as they went by on the fly. When I went to work in 1943, uh, telegraph was used for these movement instructions on branch lines, but on the main line it was mostly done by telephone because telephone it was... Uh, much faster. Uh, when I was at Easton uh, also uh, it was very dangerous because they had a, a night passenger train that was in competition with the Milwaukee Railroad for passenger service and so it came down on double track to single track and I would line the switch for them to come from double track on to single track and they were supposed to come at a slower speed but they didn't. They just came down there I don't know how fast and I had to hoop up orders by hand and I might catch first one engine, then the second engine, and then the mail car came along with a lighted doorway, and I had to throw a mail bag on at the same time they threw one over my head. And I'd reach down in the snow and catch the conductor and then catch the rear brakeman, and they whistled off through the night. And I'd come back in and shake. <laughs> at the Milwaukee Depot, there was a uh, telegraph office and the telegrapher sat in there and she had her own office because taking, um, you know, sending code and receiving code took concentration so you couldn't have all the confusion of the office. And then the freight agent, uh, he had his own office and then there was us girls and there was the cashier that was there. 
there was a rate clerk and the rate clerk would check the the um, bills, the bill of lading to make sure they were charged the right amount and then it was given to the expense clerks which is what I did more than anything and that was you sat at an electric typewriter and you typed up billing and um, and that was sent out. The cashier then got it and sent it out to collect it. I believe the telegrapher that Doris is talking about was Leah Carroll. And Leah hired out on the Milwaukee Railroad in 1917 and worked all over the division from uh, Beverly, Washington, all the way west, all the way down to Chehalis. But the last 25 or 30 years of her life were spent being the day operator at Auburn. Some of the people that I remember at the time that I was working as a telegrapher around the depot at Auburn and at the yard office were Art Torklep, the general yard master in the yard office. Uh, he was considered kind of a hard taskmaster, but when he saw that I was sleeping on rolls of teletype paper in the back room, he offered me the opportunity to come to his house and sleep on his couch which I thought was a kind gesture, but since I only had a day or two left to work here at that time, I declined. The agent at the depot at Auburn was uh, George C. Armstrong. His uh, grandfather had been G.B. Cliff, who had been an early superintendent of the Northern Pacific, and George was a rather jovial character, but I remember he was quite strict about some things, and one day I went uptown and bought a bottle of root beer, and it looked like it was in a beer bottle, and I put it in the drinking fountain and turned the fountain on to cool it off. And George came running around the corner and he says, you have to get that bottle of beer out of here. We don't drink beer on the job. And I said, well, okay then. And I went over and got the bottle of root beer and uncorked it and drank it. <laughs> and I thought he was going to have apoplexy. But uh, it was kind of a mean trick to pull on him, I guess. But after he discovered that it was only a bottle of root beer, he thought it was very funny. Glenn Staley was the road foreman of engines, in other words, a traveling engineer and a supervisor of the locomotive engineers. But he kind of took it on himself to pay attention to a lot of other things. And he was a rather enigmatic character. He was a great, big, imposing man. And on some days, he would bring you a box of candy and a bouquet of flowers and be just as nice as could be. And on another day, when you least expect it, he'd be looking around the corner, and he'd catch you doing something you shouldn't be doing. And he could be formidable. But uh, on balance, I wish we had more people like Glenn Staley back here again. Uh, Glenn's son, Bruce, became a telegrapher for the railroad and worked around Auburn Yard and in the valley here quite a bit, but Bruce went on to college and has become a doctor. Roman Polsky was the car foreman in charge of repairing broken down, damaged railroad cars. We had a, a very large car shop here at one time that did car repair work, and Mr. Polsky was the foreman for many years. On the section crew, Joe Rosati was the section foreman. Joe had come here from the old country, from Italy. And uh, he had started up on the mountain, Stampede Martin area, and finally gotten down to this area. And I think he was in his 80s when he retired. His son-in-law, Matt Fioretti, was the assistant foreman here for a while. Matt eventually wound up being track supervisor for Burlington Northern. At the roundhouse and diesel shop, the man in charge down there during my time in Auburn was Victor Rickey, or Vic, Vic Rickey. And as were all of the people that were supervisors at Auburn, you had to do your job, and they expected a day's work for a day's pay, but Vic, just like all the rest of them, was, a, was very fair, very pleasant to work with, and, and a, a gentlemanly sort. There also was, at one time, a large contingent of B&B &B employees. Now, B&B &B doesn't stand for bed and breakfast. That's bridge and building. And these were people that could do everything from repair a knot hole in the floor to build a railroad bridge. And they were, they were carpenters. And Jess Robb was the foreman in charge of that crew. And uh, if you needed a table built or if you needed some shelving in the depot or if a platform had rotted out or if a bridge needed replacement, these were the people that you called. Auburn was a very self-contained railroad location at one time. Anything that could be done, that needed to be done, any part of the railroad, anywhere on the railroad could be done by personnel at Auburn. There was a lot of colorful, other colorful people on the railroad, the yard masters. I worked as a yard master and uh, switchman 
Every shift had its own unique little thing. Uh, every shift had a certain amount of engines working, two on the north end, two on the south end of the yard, and one usually worked the rip track. So in every engine had three switchmen, or two switchmen, one switch foreman, and the hog head and the uh, fireman in every engine. Well then later on the fireman was pulled out of there because they didn't need him anymore with the diesel when the diesels came in in the early 50s. Well a caboose was the, of course on the rear end of the train and it was a place for the conductor and two of the brakemen. They had three brakemen on the train. There was a head brakeman that uh, rode up in the engine and then a flagman and a uh, what they call a swing brakeman that rode in the caboose along with a conductor and the conductor had a desk that he worked on his reports and the cupola when the train was moving there would be uh, a brakeman on each side who looked ahead for uh, what were called hot boxes back with before cars all became equipped with roller bearings, they had friction bearings that had uh, oil and waste for lubrication. And once in a while, uh, they would uh, run out of oil, or the it would dry up, and and the uh, the heat of the uh, metal axle on the bearing would heat up and. Uh, make a flame and smoke, and they had to watch for that. And if that happened, they had to either uh, usually set out the car. And if they let it keep burning and get hotter and hotter, that would cause a derailment. The axle would burn off, and the, and the car would fall down on the track. And usually, if the train is going very fast, there would be a bunch of cars behind the hot box car that would pile up in a big heap. The head brakeman, he's the one that works the head end of the train. And he goes down to the roundhouse, picks up the engine, brings it down to the yard office, and then he gets the instructions of where the train is made, and he takes the engine out and puts it on the train. And then at the beginning when I went to work, we had three brakemen on the crew and a conductor. You had a head brakeman, a rear brakeman, and a swing brakeman. The swing brakeman worked the list. He was kind of the boss brakeman of the other ones. And then the rear brakeman was a flagman. And the head brakeman worked the head end. So you had brakemen all through the train that, you know, that handled it. And uh, so then you get your train and the conductor would get his papers. We had to write up every one of them and then all the destinations and the, what was in the cars. And, and then you'd take and go out and separate your bills when you come to a station. You'd put them, give them to the operator there. And, and uh, it's just kind of repetitious after that until you come back in and then you come into the yard. The head brakeman take the engine back to the roundhouse. And then he'd come back to the yard office and the rest of the crew would be there. And then the conductor would take the tie up and, and we'd go home. But it was, uh, you, were, you, were, you were busy quite a bit of the time. There was a lot of riding too, but you were busy. Well, you had two men or three men riding in the caboose. You had the swing brakeman, the rear brakeman, and the conductor. And if there was work to do along the way, the swing brakeman rode ahead with the head brakeman, and the two of them up there would do the work. And uh, if you were in non-automatic block territory, you had to send a flagman out every time you stopped to flag the train behind you because you didn't know who was coming. And we didn't have any radios in or anything else, you know. And then you had, when you got your work done, you had to call the flagman in. And uh, he'd leave a few Z, and every so many minutes he'd drop off another one so they wouldn't overrun him, you know, and go out. And, and then when he got on the train, well, you'd give a highball to the engineer, and away you go. And sometimes the guys would get left, you know. Yeah, they would. They had some... And one old conductor there that he told me one time, he says, I wait for no man or boy, he says. When he was ready to go, he went, and he left me up there on the mountain or on the, up at Maltby Hill one time. <laughs> and that's quite a walk from there down to Woodenville. <laughs> this is an automatic block signal of the semaphore type, which was installed in about 1918, 1920 era on all of the trackage in the 
Kent Valley and also on tracks east out of Auburn all the way to Yakima. Uh, its purpose was to keep the trains spaced at least one signal apart from each other. You see it now in its clear position when a train was approaching but not uh, really close about two block signals away the signal would fall to the yellow position and when a train was in between this signal and the next signal the signal would fall all the way down to the red or stop position. The installation of these signals eliminated a great many telegrapher jobs back uh, about the time of World War I. We restored it uh, and put it on display here in the museum at Auburn and it's probably one of the very last of its kind on display anywhere around here. When I was down at the yard office after I'd come, I'd come to work for Burlington Northern, there were, um, I was way down at the end of the office, and you know the office was on about 12th Street, and I was way down probably five blocks and I was verifying a train walking along and it was just, the sun was just starting to come up and I was walking along and I could hear these something behind me and they were really going and the faster they walked the faster I walked and then I came out to the opening where the yard office was and I turned around and looked and it was about five men and of course I by this time I was weak from <laughs> walking so fast. Anyway they had Done, they had committed some crime in Seattle and went down to the art office and jumped on the train and rode out here and they were on the run and of course the police were watching for them so I'm, they got picked up right after that. But I, can never, I was so frightened. At night uh, there was no lights in the yard. You carry your own lantern with you and uh, you check cars down the tracks. A lot of times you'd run into hobos. They'd never bother you except to ask which train is going this way, which train is going that way. How do I know about this and things like that? And you just tell them there's an empty box car that's going to Yakima, get in it. And they get in and nobody would bother them. And they wouldn't bother you. Sometimes they'd get in a fight because they only had one bottle between them and somebody was drinking too much or something like that. We got to know quite a few of the old bows because they'd come to Auburn, get off here, and then take the train to Yakima so they'd go over there and pick fruit or work in the orchards, pruning and stuff like that there. Yes, it was against the rules, but they turned their backs to a lot of it because they were people out looking for work, you know. They were going over to pick apples or going into Seattle, catch a train to Wenatchee to pick cherries. They were all, most of them, that's what it was. They weren't uh, bad people, they were just looking for work. Well, a big change for Auburn came with the uh, merger in 1970 when uh, Northern Pacific uh, and Great Northern were combined along with uh, Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy in the Midwest and the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle uh, all became part of Burlington Northern. We fought it. The city of Auburn had a what they called the Auburn Industrial Committee. It was formed by uh, all the old railroad guys, uh, clerks, conductors, uh, section guys, everybody. We met in the old fraternity hall. It used to be up above J.C. Penney's. And uh, Charlie Huff was a president of it, was a vice president of it. And we fought it, no end. We got L.B. Long, who used to be a um, lawyer in town here. Uh, he, was, he did a lot of fighting for us. And we went after him. And that's when they formed the N.P the GN, the CB&Q, and the sp &S Railroad all went together and formed the Burlington Northern, or it was called then when they first come out, Great Northern Pacific and Quincy Railroad. That was the first name that came out. Well, they had to shorten it, so they just called it the BN, and that stands for bad news to all of us. Well, Rogers told about the uh, committee that was formed in Auburn to oppose the merger and they called themselves the Auburn Anti-Merger Committee. There was also an anti-merger committee at Livingston, Montana and they were a force to be reckoned with. Uh, I believe that 
that they raised enough of a ruckus that they actually did improve things a little bit for the employees here who otherwise would have just been scattered to the four winds. As it turned out, they were scattered to the four winds anyway, but it took the railroad a lot longer to do it because they had to adhere to some of the agreements that they had made for employee protection. And uh, we owe the, we of the community owe the Auburn Anti-Merger Committee a debt of gratitude for that. Mr. McFarlane had been president of the Northern Pacific at the time the merger talks started. And he was a rather reasonable sort of a fellow, but as things progressed, he was replaced by Louis W. Mink, who had come to the Northern Pacific as president, replacing McFarlane. Mink had been off the Frisco, which was a southern railroad, and they were a little stricter in their attitude toward employees. And if it hadn't been for the anti-merger committee, I think that uh, Auburn Yard would have vanished a lot sooner than it did. Yeah, it, it, it gradually faded away, you know. And they moved stuff, and which everybody thought was a big mistake. They went to Balmer Yard with everything, and Balmer couldn't handle it. And we had this great big yard sitting here, and it just sat there. The Great Northern Line uh, from Seattle to Everett and on east through Wenatchee to Spokane became the main line because it was about 90 miles shorter than the Northern Pacific. Northern Pacific uh, on this line across the state of Washington went um, through uh, Ellensburg to Yakima and then down to Pasco and then from Pasco up to Spokane and that was about 90 miles longer than the Great Northern and the Milwaukee. So. Uh, Auburn Yard, uh, instead of being a major railroad terminal as it was in the Northern Pacific, uh, well, it, it lost out. <laughs> as the computer took over, all that, you know, nobody sat at a typewriter typing bills. It was all computerized. And so all those jobs were gone. It really didn't affect us that much right off the bat. It took over a period of time it did. Because the day of the merger, the BN in the, or the NP and the CB and Q and the Great Northern that merged, well then that started one railroad. Well then things begin to change a little bit. Some of the work that we did, the GN would do. Some of the work the GN we'd do, and there was a lot of animosity between the men then because they thought we were taking over their job, and they thought that we were, that they were, we thought they were taking over ours, and it was not true. And then, then gradually the guys got used to it, you know, and got to working with each other, and things smoothed out. Yeah, and so it went on like that, and then Amtrak come in and took over, and then that's, well, that's the last time I worked passenger was when Amtrak took over. I didn't want to work with them. Well, there, there again, uh, a year after the merger, uh, came Amtrak. The... Um, up until Amtrak, each railroad had its uh, passenger train service uh, and, and a lot of um, uh, local type passenger trains. Uh, Northern Pacific had, well each road had a, a premier train. Uh, Northern Pacific had the North Coast Limited, the Great Northern had the Empire Builder, the Milwaukee had the Olympian, later Olympian Hiawatha, and the Union Pacific had the city of Portland. And these were fast trains that didn't make many stops. But then each road had a secondary train that did make a lot more local stops. And uh, up until the mid-50s, um, there were branch line trains like from Seattle down to Hoquiam. And way back there were three trains a day to Hoquiam out of Seattle. But with automobiles and buses that kind of faded away. Uh, they closed down the diesel house here, sent the men uh, to uh, Vancouver, Washington, or up to Seattle, where the big uh, GN freight uh, roundhouse is. They closed down the yard office, and uh, cleaning tracks went out the window. They closed up everything. I think there's uh, uh, maybe five or six guys working here now. When we had around 500 people working here at that time, that meant a lot to the economy of Auburn. Some of the clerks mostly went to Tacoma, the carmen went to Tacoma and Seattle, and uh, the trainmen were called out of Seattle then. Uh, they quit calling them out of Auburn. So things just faded away, uh, tore the buildings down. Roundhouse got tore down first, a big old roundhouse, and 
And uh, then they told it, tore the diesel house down, and they, the diesel house uh, yard office uh, tore that down. And then they gave the yard office away here for a dollar. East Auburn Depot, they gave it away for a dollar just to get rid of it. And they tore up a lot of tracks. People say, where was the diesel house? Where was the roundhouse? You know, the trains would pull into that, um, into the stall, and the men would, there was a cement floor that came up as high as the, as the uh, cab or the engine or this whatever of the, and so I, I think that's still out there. Well, the only thing left is that water treatment plant. It's still there. And um, the material department, the brick building sitting where it's at is still there. The warehouses are gone. And, and of course, the car shops was, was torn down. But it was all along A Street there. When you, you started, as you went under the viaduct, the first thing you came to was the diesel house, and the roundhouse was gone by the time I got there, but it was behind it. And, um, and then you all the way down to 12th Street, where the art office was, why, and the section, section office was down there, where the section men worked. So It was an interesting time. I really liked working for the railroad, and I put my girls through college working for the railroad, and I know it, I, I, we got paid a good wage, women especially, you know, that was, to get the same thing as a man got was pretty good wages. Yeah, there was a lot of camaraderie with the railroad, there really was, the guys, you know, it, it, you, you were like brothers, you really were, you got so close to them that, uh, I know my best friend that, well, he got killed, but he, uh, him and I were friends. We hunted together and everything for 40 years. And, and uh, it just, people, I mean, he was just like a brother to me, just exactly like a brother. And, you know, you, it's hard to find people like that, but the railroad had them. And I got, still got a lot of good friends like that, that were just that close together, you know. I was the last person here. I was the yard master and clerk. I sat in front of a computer and uh, everything was done on a computer. The pencil was a thing of the past then. We usually went through a pencil every two or three days writing out train reports, but everything was gone at that time and uh, they called me from uh, Tacoma and says, uh, your job is gone. Sent me my notice. And I had to go to Tacoma in 1984, 85 and finish up my career and I retired in 1992 after 47 years with the railroad. And I'd do it again if I could, but I can't. <laughs> it is an interesting part of our history, the railroad, and Auburn was such a center of it. For more historical views of Auburn, come see us at the White River Valley Museum at 918 H Street in the Lesco of Community Campus, or you can visit us online at www www.wrvmuseum.org. The museum is open Wednesday through Sunday from 12 to 4 p.m. Call us at 253-288-7433 for more information. Thanks for watching. Please join us again for another unique perspective on Auburn, our story. With every passing moment, history is made. What will yours be?